Okay. So we'll begin. Tonight's lecture is about Midat Rahmanut, about mercy, compassion, empathy, sensitivity. As you know, we've been doing a series about Midot, about characteristics, about working on one's character, refining one's personality. That requires a tremendous amount of work. Not everybody is born possessing all the good midot, all the good qualities. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. And Judaism puts a very <coughs> big emphasis on working on one's midot. This actually entails a very large part of our life. We go through life, Baruch Hashem, fulfilling mitzvot and commandments. That may be the easy part. The more difficult part is working on oneself. Working on oneself is very rewarding. If one works on himself, on his weaknesses, he will Zat Hashem have a better relationship with one's spouse, with one's children, <coughs> with one's neighbors. In general, he will be more liked. He will be a better person. He will be a happier individual. So it's to, to our benefit that we maximize our potential, not just in mitzvot, of course, but in working on one's midot. In order to work on one's midot, one needs tools. And these tools are found, for the most part, in the Torah, of course, in the various midrashim, in the many stories and examples, <coughs> but also in Sifrei Musar, in books about ethics and morals. And it is important to follow the advice of the Chachamim and use the tools that are given to us in the Sifrei Musar as opposed to using the tools that the non-Jewish world applies, because even though some of their tools and tips may be acceptable, they don't always share the same hashkafat olam, they don't always share the same views about life. So when one needs to go to a marriage counselor, for example, or to a specialist, or to anybody who can help with one's character, with one's personality, it would be important that this individual who's going to be giving the help have a Torah view of life. So what we'll be covering here is the Torah view about certain midot, but occasionally I will introduce and share with you certain tips that psychologists, therapists have found to be helpful too. So we're basing ourselves always on what the Torah and the Chachamim say, but we, from time to time, use or borrow some of the tips that are outside there that are sometimes very helpful as well. In speaking about Midat HaRachamim, I need to give you a very brief introduction that is a little bit Kabbalistic in nature. So you may find it a little bit difficult to understand some of the terms, but you will see as we go along why I began with this introduction. The creation of the world, Riata Olam, the rabbis tell us, consists of two midot that Hashem has, midat din and midat rachamim, the attribute of justice and the attribute of mercy. The creation of the world was created with these two attributes in mind. It needs to be so. We need to have justice, because what justice means is there needs to be certain limits there needs to be certain limitations or rules in this world. But there also needs to be midat rahamim or rahmanut. There needs to be a way out, a way that allows for change. So rahmanut implies flexibility. It is more expansive. It is more tolerant. Where din is justice, is more strict. But the world as a, as a whole was created with the combination of the two. In order to be able to see the combination of the two working in unison, you have to understand one of the Midot in Kabbalah called Tiferet. Tiferet is Chesed and Rahamim, or Chesed and Givura. It is Din and Rahamim. It is the exact two opposites, the justice and the mercy, combined together. A quick example of where you find the two in real life 
is the amputation of someone's leg that has gangrene, a disease that if it's not cut off will spread and kill the entire body. So that amputation is din, it is strict, it is harsh, it is painful. But in the end, we all know that it's for the benefit of this human being, of this individual, that that leg be removed. So we have here compassion. We have here rachamim for the individual. But that rachamim has to come about through din, through an amputation, through surgery. In the same way, you have ahava. Even though ahava sounds like love, sounds like rachamim, it really is a combination of the two. True love embodies the two attributes because true love, ahavat Hashem, for the world means whatever it takes that will benefit the world. True love implies tov, implies that which is good in the eyes of God. And that which is good in the eyes of Hashem is that which is shlemut, that which is complete, that which will benefit mankind and the world. And sometimes that involves din. So you have a combination of din and achamim. And this idea will help you understand another concept later on. So that's why I'm giving you this introduction to rem- to rem- for us to remember that even though sometimes a particular act may appear to be sadistic, may appear to be cruel, just remember what we just said, that if it comes from Hashem, it involves both or it can involve both, I should say, ultimately for the good of mankind. Sometimes, however, Midat Rahamim comes down by itself. That is one of the Midot of HaKadosh Baruch Hu of the Almighty, Rahum Vehanun, that he has compassion, he has mercy, and sometimes the Hanhaga, the direction of the world, the operation of the world, at a particular moment, is being driven by this particular midah. And these midot that Hashem has are given over to our neshama. The neshama, as the Zohar explains, is a chelek eloka mimal, it is a part of God. And since it, it is divine, a part of God, it has in it, embedded in it, these midot, one of them being midat arachamim, which is the one we're talking about today. Now, even though it is embedded in the neshama, we all know by now that this neshama is obviously in a vessel, in a vessel called the goof, the body, that has its own desires, that has its own agenda, its own interests. And even though this beautiful, pure neshama may have, may contain certain pure midot, they're not always necessarily... On the surface, they're not always necessarily operating full force. Part of the idea why we have Shabbat is in order to be able to experience the Neshama to its fullest. A Jew who observes Shabbat properly is able to experience a little bit of Olam Abba, of the world to come. It's a spiritual day, a day where we abstain from work. And that day was given to us to rest from the physical world in order to give more room for the neshama to express itself. The neshama is caged in this body throughout the six days of the week. It, visits, it, it, is busy, it is busy because the goof has to work for a living to pay its bills and has to do all kinds of things to survive. And the neshama is sitting there, even though it, it, it is the one that's gonna make the final decision, the neshama is the captain of the ship, the neshama has the ability to make decisions, it does not always make the right decision. Unfortunately, this conflict of neshama and goof, soul and body, is a constant conflict. And for those of you who are here, for many of the lectures that where we spoke about free will, it's a necessity that we have this conflict because that is how reward and punishment are given. That is what trials are all about. That is what life is all about. In other words, even though certain things are obvious to us, they, are, they become not obvious as soon as we enter the real world, as soon as we are exposed to all sorts of temptations. Yes, it is obvious to us because we were, 
We're told that, we, we learned about it, the Torah writes about it, so it's obvious. On the one hand, Hashem says so, but from, from learning about it to doing it, it is a very, very long road. Not everybody who knows something and understands it necessarily fulfills it or carries it out. There's something, obviously, that stands in the way. We are told to be a certain way, be charitable, be kind, be merciful, be sensitive. Yes, this all makes sense and we agree with it. But when it comes to actually performance, a lot of people fail. So let's not forget that failure is part of human nature. It is due to the fact that the body does not always agree with the neshama, even though it's common sense. There's a conflict of interests and so forth. So it is not easy to always do the right thing, even if we know it. The bigger problem, however, is when the mind becomes an attorney and it starts justifying why it's okay and acceptable to do the wrong thing. Then we're into trouble. Because as long as the mind is in agreement with the neshama, then the, the one will have the ability to feel sorry and to regret and to take steps, hopefully, to change one's ways. But if the mind is not in agreement, is not in sync with the neshama, either because it's not knowledgeable or because it has a conflict of interest, then we're in trouble. A person can live his whole life thinking that what he's doing is okay, it's acceptable, he, has, he can justify it. Then he's in trouble. But if one is understanding of what is the right thing to do, he just has a hard time, then there's hope. There's hope that one of these days, if he learns, if he's serious, if he's awakened if, and motivated to do the right thing, then somehow he will do it. So this midah, midah tarachmanut, is a midah of Hashem. Because we have a neshama that is a part of God, we also have that embedded in us. It may be dormant, but it's there. Where is this midah not dormant at all? It's always, for the most part, there, regardless of whether you are Chinese, Jewish, makes no difference. Where is it always there? Anybody know? Where is Rahmanut always almost there? The Rahmanut of a father over his son. Most normal parents, normal, right, have that naturally in them to have that Rahmanut for their children. Oy vavoy, chaz they wouldn't have it. Hashem, of course, put it there because we need that. Not only do human beings have it naturally in them, even animals have it. Try to take away a baby calf from its mother. Just about anyone. Nobody just says, oh, hey, go ahead, take it. You're hungry? Go ahead. Right? <laughs> so Rahmanut, you see, is natural in a cert to a certain degree. A certain kind of Rahmanut is natural. That is the Rahmanut a father has for his child. One also has a natural Rahmanut for his body. Most people do, not everybody. In other words, that we're concerned about how we feel, you know, we hopefully take care of our bodies, we're concerned about how we look. There's a certain pity that we take for ourselves. The real pity, however, should be more for the neshama, that the neshama should come out winning, not the physical body. In other words, in this life struggle, where there is a struggle between the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah the evil and the good inclinations, we are hoping that we will give more importance and, and a lot more effort and time will be invested in our neshama than on our physical body. Because ultimately the essence of the human being really is his neshama and not the body. The body will rot in the grave anyway. What do you care? I'm not telling you to disregard it and ignore it and, and not be healthy. Yes, it's important to do the mitzvot and to live a healthy life so we can properly, we can function. But don't overdo it. Remember, the more important one of the two is the neshama. So you care about your goof, about your body, but remember, you should care more about the neshama. We also have commandments to have pity. In other words, even though these are natural, the, the, the pity or the compassion that we have for ourselves and that we have for our children, we also have commandments. The commandments are necessary because they're not natural. Have compassion for the poor, right? By giving them charity, by taking care of them. Be sensitive to the needs of the strangers amongst you. Amongst, amongst you, meaning those who have joined you, like Gerim converts, 
those who are foreigners who have come to live amongst you. Be sensitive and compassionate for them. For we need a mitzvah, a commandment from God to cultivate that Rahmanut because it's not natural. Do you know how many people in this country are upset <coughs> at the Mexicans who come over to this country? And they say, well, they take away our jobs. Let them go back to where they came from. And it's a big mahloket, by the way. There's a big argument and discussion between the Democrats and Republicans how they see this illegal alien problem. It is a problem. I'm not saying it's not. But you cannot just be cruel and send them back, especially if where you're sending them back, the country you're sending them back, is a very dangerous place to be. Especially now. Yeah. So depending, of course, where these immigrants are coming from, one has to be careful in looking at the whole picture. So we have commandments in the Torah because of these kind of situations where one on his own may not be compassionate, be compassionate, considerate, and sensitive to certain individuals. There is another commandment that is sometimes necessary too, even though it's more natural, and that is with relatives. Umibsarcha al titalam. Don't ignore or don't look away from the plight of your own relative, your brother, your cousin, your nephew. He's your relative. That means you have more responsibility towards him. Even though this is more natural because he's close to you, but you bet you'd be surprised how many people don't want to know of their nephews. The nephew is a poor individual and the uncle is rich. Famous, you know, story, examples of a rich uncle who doesn't care about his poor nephew. Why? Because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't care. He doesn't have it so much in him to have pity for him. So we need a mitzvah, we need a tzivuy, we need a commandment. Be careful, you have more responsibility towards those who are closer to you. We also have a certain sensitivity in the Torah towards animals. Tsar bale chayim is isur doraita. It is a prohibition by the Torah to inflict pain on animals unnecessarily. You want to hunt them because you want to eat them with shahita, you slaughter it properly. You want even to have the fur of the ferret, for example, so you can make a shtrimal, you know those hats that the Hasidim use. It is not prohibited. You're allowed to benefit from, from animals. They're not only for human consumption. Right? They're, you can use them for their leather. I mean, after all, how do we make leather? Right? You could use it for kilaf. You know, you need to write a sefer Torah. Where are you going to get the kilaf, the parchment from? You're going to get it from a kosher animal. You don't have to eat it if you don't want to. I mean, you're not going to throw away the, the meat, right? So there are many things that we can use from animals. Nevertheless, make sure that you're not cruel to it. You have to be sensitive. You see your enemy's donkey overloaded with cargo. It's not so much because he's your enemy who's having a hard time that you have to have pity on his animal. It's for the animal himself. Have pity for the animal that is having a hard time and help your enemy, you know, with that individual who you dislike, who you haven't spoken to in a while, help him unload so that you relieve the animal of some of its pain. So what do we see from all of these? These are examples of sensitivity, compassion, rahmanut, even for animals. The Torah has everyone in mind. You can't just you know, ignore, you have to feel, you have to do something about it if you can. And sometimes because it doesn't come naturally, there is a mitzvah or a tzivuy, a commandment to do it. And if you don't do it, then you missed out on a big mitzvah. So this idea of having the Rahmanut as a mitzvah is very, very important. The reason why it's important is because sometimes we are in a situation where we may not want to do the right thing. For example, let's say a child is misbehaving. He's your child. Now, what did we say before? On a child, one has natural Rahmanut. <coughs> okay, natural. Instinct. It's instinct. However, he's misbehaving. He's doing the wrong thing. And because he's doing the wrong thing, here there is a mitzvah to give him a patch, as we say in Yiddish, to give him a slap. Not to abuse him, of course, not to be cruel to him, but to do it in a way that is acceptable. 
that is Musar, that is a lesson that he needs to be, to uh, that he needs to be taught. This time there's no reason to be Rahmanut, to, ha to have mercy. On the contrary, the Musar, the rebuke, is the Rahmanut. This point, make sure you understand very clearly because it will help you understand a very important Mamar Chazal, a very important Midrash. This time when we are rebuking the child who is our child, who we have pity for, who we like and we love and so forth, this time when I rebuke, that rebuke, even if it's Beshevet, you know, was with, a, with, with some sort of whip, right? Not a big whip, of course. Even though I'm using something painful, I'm inflicting pain, this pain is Rachmanut. Why is it Rachmanut? Because there is a Tzivui Eloki. Rachmanut is not just something natural that comes to us naturally by instinct. Rachmanut is also a Tzivui Eloki. It's a commandment. And when God commands us to have compassion, sometimes that commandment to have compassion is a painful type of compassion. The application of what I'm about to do to that child may not appear to us as compassion, but I have a tzivuya loki. What is that commandment? I have a tzivuya loki to rebuke, to teach him a lesson. And that lesson and that rebuke is a form of rachmanut. So I always need to remember that rachmanut is not something that I make up, that I understand on my own, that comes naturally to me. Sometimes rachmanut is from above. It is a commandment, and sometimes that commandment does not appear to be the same kind of Rahmanut that I'm used to. Here, rebuking a child is considered Rahmanut. What? I'm rebuking him. I'm hitting him. I'm telling him off. Yes, that's a form of Rahmanut because you want to make sure that that child goes in the right derech. He does the right thing. He does not stray. He stays on the right path. He remains observant. And therefore, it's to his benefit. So I'm doing something for his good. So I have pity for his soul. I really have compassion for him. So that rebuke is a good type of rebuke. But if I would not have the tzivuya loki, the commandment, I wouldn't think of it that way. And that is why a lot of the non-Jewish world today does not believe, believe in that kind of a rebuke. Whether it's in the school, between teacher and students, whether it's parents and their children, they don't believe in that. They think, oh, it's terrible. You're being sadistic, you're being cruel, you're being abusive. They have all kinds of names for it. But then they regret it when they see the, the rate of crime climbing up and the, and the disrespect in the schools and so forth. They don't understand that Shlomo Melech in Mishlei and, uh, and elsewhere, the very Mamre Chazal, spoke about the importance of not holding back the whip or the rod of rebuke when necessary. This is for the good. This is the ultimate compassion that we have for the child because we want him to succeed. The best way to understand this kind of compassion is that the tzivuya eloki, whenever there's a commandment of God, is, it's for the tikkun ha'olam. The word tikkun ha'olam means what? That this is for the benefit, for the rectification of the world. In order for the world to be what Hashem wanted it to be, certain things have to happen. Now that we understand more or less, what Rahmanut is, what compassion is, and how sometimes there's a commandment for it. We have to, however, be careful not to misuse it. For example, not only with the example I gave you with children, rabbis tell us, Lo badin. Be careful not to use too much compassion in din, in justice. Let's say you have a poor guy coming to you, and he's suing a rich man. And you might say, well, I'm going to make sure that the poor man wins the case. Well, the rich man has enough money anyway. Even though the rich man is the one that's right in the case, you can't do that. You can't corrupt the justice. You have to be doing everything according to the halakha, according to din. You can't take that into consideration that this man is poor. Now, if the rich man on his own wants to have pity on the poor man, that's very nice of him. But you as a judge cannot do that. You have to be fair, right? You have to be correct. You have no right to show compassion in the deen itself, in the outcome of the just, of the, of the, of the ruling. On, on the other hand, there are times where you should be considerate if somebody owes somebody money 
and he does not have the money to pay. You can help him, you can be compassionate and be considerate and allow for some sort of arrangement of installments and not demand, you better come up with the money now. You don't have to be strict. That, there, are, there are times that you can be compassionate, even though this involves money that, it, that was borrowed, as long as he's willing to pay. However, there are times when Rahmanut is very dangerous. It's completely not allowed. There's only one time in the Torah, for, for the most part, where you're not allowed to have any pity whatsoever under no circumstances. And what is that? When is that? With Amalek. With Amalek, there's a very unusual mitzvah. Kill them all off. Even the animals. Very unusual. Some would even say, oh, the Jews are barbaric. You know, look at what they're doing. Look at the, the, the Bible that they have. Commands them to destroy, to annihilate, annihilate everything, even animals. What did the animals do? There's no logic there. If you apply logic like Shaul HaMelech did, you'll make a big mistake. For those of you who learned a little bit Tanakh and remember, Shaul HaMelech made a big mistake with that. He had pity. He allowed Agag, the king of Amalek, to survive. He left him alone. And he also left some of the animals. He did not fulfill the commandment of Hashem. And that is why he lost the Melucha. He lost the rain. He lost the rights to be, continue to be a king. And at the end, he also got killed in one of the battles. He and his sons. He and his sons. Now, what happened over here? What went wrong? Shaul HaMelech was a saint, was a tzaddik, a humble man, a good man in every way. What went wrong? Rabbis tell us, Kol HaMerachem al achzarim lebasof na'asa achzari al rachmanim. Whoever has pity, compassion for the cruel, in the end, he will be cruel on those who are compassionate. In other words, since he, was good, he was good and kind to the cruel, he will end up eventually, chas shalom, God forbid, being cruel to those who are good people, who don't deserve to die. This applied to Shaul HaMelech. Shaul, after having made this mistake, sometime later, had everybody in the city of Nov, Nov was the city of Kohanim, all killed, Jews, Kohanim, men, women, animals, everything. Why? Because he suspected that they helped out David HaMelech. David HaMelech, David later on David HaMelech, that time he wasn't a Melech yet, David was his enemy. He didn't want him around. He went after him, tried to find him and kill him. And he was the son of Yes. And somehow, because there was some Lashonara, somebody who informed partial information that David Amelach was seen in this particular city, because of that, that led to suspicion that they were collaborating with David. So Shaul had them all killed. How did Shaul Amelach kill them all? These are Jews. They didn't do anything wrong. He didn't even investigate. He was just suspicious, upset, and had them all killed. So we go back to the words of the Midrash, and the Midrash explains, listen, whoever has that tendency to go against Hashem's ratzon, Hashem's wish, and instead of, have, instead of being cruel to the cruel, instead of being strict with them, instead of going after the cruel, the wicked, one is compassionate to them and does not eliminate them as he's supposed to, in the end, he will, his mind will be so twisted that he will, be mer he will be cruel to the merciful. For him to be capable of killing Jews is only because of his mistake of, ha of having compassion over Amalek. But how did it happen? The, the way it happened, the commentaries explain, is because he did not follow the Tzivu Yeloki. He followed his own judgment, his common sense, his own nature, his own instinct of wanting to have pity on them. If you get, okay, nothing will happen. I have pity on them. It's chaval. What a, what, a, what, a, what a shame to just destroy everything. I could use some of the animals. He did not follow that tzibur. Look, when you don't follow Hashem's law, Hashem's commandment, and you follow your own judgment, you're going to make a big mistake. And once you twist things around one way, you will twist around things the other way too. Here he twisted, with Amalek he twisted it, 
instead of being cruel, he was compassionate. In the end, he will twist it the other way too. He will be cruel where he needs to be compassionate and he needs to be sensitive. Because it was not done Lashem Shemaim, because he was not doing things according to the Tzivui, the commandment of God, once you twist things around according to your own beliefs and ideas, then you get into trouble. There was once a rabbi who observed a German goy kissing his dog. And he said, in this place where the men kiss their dogs, these same men are going to butcher human beings. And that's exactly what happened later on in the Holocaust. They kissed their dogs. They were compassionate, so sensitive to their animals, which is twisted. It's a, it's a, it's a twisted kind of a mind. I mean, you can be, of course, sensitive to animals, as we said before, but this was in an extreme way, in a very unusual way, right? That he says, I can tell from that, from this kind of a twisted mind, that this place, these same people will butcher human beings. In the same way that Shaul got things twisted around, in the same way we saw by the Germans, the Havdil, of course, twist things around by being more compassionate and more caring about their animals than about human beings. Rabbis tell us there are times that somebody comes to kill you, you kill him first. But what do the Christians do? Give him the other cheek. Have you heard that? They have that kind of a belief, the Christians. If somebody slaps you in the face, give him the other cheek. You know? In other words, be forgiving. There's a certain extreme... Uh, rahmanut or extreme compassion that is uh, crazy, that is totally not acceptable. It, it doesn't make sense. That is why we needed Sivuya Loki, a commandment from God, to spell out or to define to us when yes and when not. And one who does not do that can get himself into trouble. With Amalek, the commandment of God to destroy Amalek is Rachmanut. What did we say before? That, that the tzivuy of Hashem is for the tikkun ha'olam. It's for the benefit of the whole world. If he says and he commands to destroy Amalek, he knows what he's talking about. Hashem knows what he's talking about. To him, this is tikkun ha'olam. Therefore, your act of destruction, of, an, of annihilating the enemy, is considered Rachmanut. It's considered compassion. It's not achzariut, it's not cruelty. But you need the tzivu yaloki, you need the commandment of God for that. You cannot do it on your own. We on our own do not know, unless it comes to our kids. And even then, rabbis tell us the women are, more compa- are very compassionate, over-compassionate sometimes. And because of that, there is always a chance that they may spoil their kids. They may pamper them. You have to be careful with that. So it's there, naturally, but even that requires certain guidelines that one should not be carried away. So in general, in general terms, Rachmanut, compassion, is something very good. It's something that we very much need. And as the Pasuk says, Hashem has pity over all His doings, over all His creation. That's one of the Midot of Hashem. And Hashem is very upset on those who do not show this midah, do not have that compassion. An example of how Hashem is upset at those who do not display compassion is a famous story in the Gemara with Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, who was the who was the one that put together the Mishnayot, once had the following incident. He was sitting learning, and all of a sudden a calf ran into his room and hid underneath him underneath where he was sitting, like trying to take cover. Where was this calf running from? From the shochet. <laughs> the shochet says, where are you? <laughs> Came out with the knife. She ran away. The calf ran away and took, you know, cover underneath Rabbi Yudha Nasi. And what did Rabbi Yudha Nasi tell the calf? Go back to the shochet. That is what you were created for. That is what you came to the world for. But Shemaim, they were very upset. Rabbi Yudan Asi did not display any compassion for the animal. 13 years of toothache. He had 13 years, you know what it is? Toothaches? 
that can be very painful. 13 years. What happened over here? According to the Kabbalah, there is, a, there is an interpreta- a kind of Kabbalistic interpretation of this story. It's not just a simple incident where the rabbi just didn't have compassion. According to the Kabbalistic interpretation of this Gemara, in that calf was a Gilgul, was a reincarnated soul of somebody that had to come into this world reincarnated temporarily in a calf. And the tikkun of that soul would be once it is slaughtered. Once it is slaughtered, then the meat is taken to the poor, people make berachot on this. That is the tikkun of that individual. So that individual who was reincarnated in the soul did not want to have that kind of a tikkun. He says, you know what, Rabbi, just pray for me instead. I don't want to go through the whole shechita. And the rabbi basically said what he said because he knew that that was the best tikkun for this individual. Otherwise, this rabbi wouldn't have some pity. So this is the Kabbalistic interpretation. The rabbi basically said, go back to the shochet. This is your tikkun. Just go through it. And once you get it over with, you'll be fine. And nevertheless, Bashamayim, they were upset at him. <coughs> rabbi, you should have shown some, some compassion for the animal. Why, what happened after 13 years? After 13 years, the maid was sweeping the house. She took the broom, and there was a couple of of weasels, a couple of weasels, baby weasels, that were in the corner of the house, and she was about to, you know, sweep, sweep them out of the house. And he said to her, leave them alone. Hashem has pity on everything in this world. Have pity on them too. Don't mistreat them. So Bashamayim at that moment, they said, they decreed, take away, remove his yesurim, his pain. He has pity, we will have pity for him too. So at that moment, the pain that he had for 13 years went away. Just a quick example of how Bashamayim, they're very strict, they're very makpid on those who do not show compassion for others. Rabbis tell us, that if you ever see an individual who has no compassion whatsoever, you can suspect that perhaps he's not from Zera Shel Avraham Avinu, from the seed of Avraham. Anyone that comes from the seed of Avraham has compassion. Some have more, some have less, but we all have compassion. This is one of our ID marks that we are from Zera Zer Oshel Avraham Avinu, that we have compassion. Now, how, how do we further develop this Midah? How do we further cultivate it? That happens in various ways. And that's what we're going to speak about now. Now that we understand the importance of this Midah, how much they care about it, how this is a Midah of Hashem, how do we cultivate it? Even though we have it in our Neshama, some have it more, some have it less. Now one of the ways that we cultivate it is very simple. The Torah gave us many mitzvot, many commandments, and what they all have, many of them have in common, is to instill in us Rachmanut. In Parshat Kedoshim that we're reading this week, Harimot Kedoshim, and in other Parshiot, you will find mitzvot that simply are to instill in us, ingrain in us, the compassion. <coughs> compassion for everything, whether it is to help the poor, to give tzedakah, whether it is to slaughter the animal in a certain way, right? Don't electrocute it, don't shoot it in the head. Do it in a very gentle way, right? There are various mitzvot that that is the idea, the main idea behind them, to instill in us compassion. And as the Sefer HaChinuch says, The hearts are affected or influenced by one's actions. If you do a certain action many, many times, your heart will be molded by it. It will learn something from it. It will be trained by certain actions. So by doing certain things over and over again, it does something to our character the Jew becomes molded in a certain way through the performance or observance of the mitzvot. So that is one way that Hashem instills in us the ability to cultivate this midah in a, in a strong way. There's even an interesting, an additional interesting way that Hashem restores back Rahmanut. What does it mean to restore? Something takes it away from us. You know what takes away Rahmanut that was there before? War. Anybody who was in the Israeli army and knows about the various yachidot, the various units, whether it's Golani or whether it's uh, Shayetet 
or whether it's Yechidat Me'avechad, as it was the famous 101 unit of Arik Sharon, he knows that in order to train for those units, you're sometimes placed in the forest, you're on your own, with no food. Tistader levad, as they say in Hebrew. You figure it out yourself. And they would grab animals and just eat them. Whatever they grabbed, whatever they could find. These people, if they were married, when they would come back home after several months, their wives would not even recognize them. They became so cruel. They had to, because they were learning to be, you know what it is to be part of those Israeli units? You really have to be very tough. So you, you, know, you have a, several reasons to be tough. First of all, they're Israeli, so they're already tough, right? Yeah. Then it's, they're part of the unit. Then they're exposed to war. You know, what it, you know what it means to be exposed to war? War takes away Rachmanut. So the, comes along the Torah. And the Torah tells us, we're going to go to war occasionally. What can we do? The Torah says, Hashem will give you Rachamim. Hashem will give us Rachamim. What does that mean? That He has compassion on us, I understand. But what does that have to do with going to war? That He will have pity on us after we're done with the war. Because He will restore the Rachmanut that was taken away from us as a result of the war. As a result of all the exposure and the brutality that we acquired through that kind of exercise, that kind of operation, means that he will give you or restore to you back the Rahmanut that you're lacking. Otherwise, magic, you imagine what we would be like after all these wars and battles? We would be like monsters, Chazu Shalom. So Hashem says, no, I want you to be gentle as you were before. So we need a special blessing from above to restore back the Rahmanut. Every time we went to war, Hashem made sure that we don't lose it completely. All right. So one way that we have the Rachmanut is because Hashem gave us a larger dose of Rachmanut. We're from the seed of Abraham Avinu. We have the mitzvot. So the, our neshama is in some ways in, enveloped with a tremendous amount of Rachmanut. Then we have the mitzvot that cultivated further. One of the mitzvot that is a very, very powerful tip in cultivating Rachmanut and sensitivity towards others, is a mitzvah in this week's parasha, one of the most famous mitzvot in the Torah. Ve'afta le'recha kamocha. You should love thy friend as yourself. Now rabbis tell us, it does not mean that you like somebody else exactly as you like yourself, because that's impossible. What does it really mean? It means as follows. Whatever you don't want people to do to you, don't do unto others. Whatever you want people to do for you, you be prepared to do for others. You want people to visit you when you're sick, be prepared to visit others when they're sick. You don't want people to harm you, to take away from you, to compete with you, then do, do it to others either. Right? Whatever kind of a relationship you want others to have towards you, make sure you have the same kind of relationship towards others. Develop this sensitivity and be considerate of other people. And in this way, you will be on the right track of cultivating a little bit more Rahmanut. Even though you may not have it as much as others may have it, by following these mitzvot, by thinking about it, by understanding what the Torah expects of you, this will help with the Midat Rahmanut. What I'm going to do now is just share with you tips that are not in the Torah necessarily, but are, that are very, very helpful in general for those who somehow are lacking in this Midat. They're not very strong in this particular area. One of them is to give a helping hand in the house. Sometimes people don't do it because it doesn't come to them. Some people, they have such a good nature, it's just second nature to them. They just do it on their own. They don't have to be told. They wash the dishes, they pick up stuff, they take out the garbage. Under, nobody has to tell them. Lucky is a woman who the husband does everything on his own, everything that she would otherwise have to ask him to do. Could you imagine? He knows when your birthday is, he buys your card, buys your gift, does the dishes for you, maybe even the cooking. Right? Helps out in the shopping. Wow, that's a big blessing. Well, I don't think too many husbands like that exist out there that do everything without everything ever having to be reminded. But there are some. They're angels, right? Such gentle people don't have to be asked to do anything. On the contrary, they volunteer. Anything else I can do for you, honey? You know what? Go, go take a nap. I'll take care of the baby. How about that? Oh, the best, the greatest wish of a woman, of a mother, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay, you've carried for nine months, now I'll carry the next nine months. Right? How about that? You know? And there's a lot of examples of where a husband can really prove himself to be considerate, compassionate, and sensitive, and all the goodies. But not everybody has that by nature. Some have it more, some have it less. But is it right? Of course it's right. Of course it's correct. Of course it's proper and very nice. To a limit, of course. You know, a woman should not abuse her husband, take advantage of him. He has to go to work the next day, too. So even though it's okay for him to wake up in the middle of the night and feed the baby, but what if he has to wake up for Nets Minyan at 6 o'clock? How is he going to do it? If he's also waking up, if he's also doing everything else, it's impossible. So you really have to be careful you don't overdo it and take advantage of your husband. Or the other way around, that you don't take advantage of your wife. Just because she's hardworking doesn't mean she should do everything, right? So you have to use some common sense. So the more one is considerate and sensitive, he will understand this on his own. You don't need, and if he needs a reminder, fine. But after he gets the reminder, he'll do it. He won't say, no, why me? Ask somebody else to do it. What's the big deal already, right? Some people put up a fight. So in order to, to increase the awareness or to make it easier for us, there are certain tips. And one of those tips is to, to help out in the house a little bit more. To visit the sick, you know somebody who's sick and you can go out and you can easily go and visit him and be with him. You're doing a tremendous chesed, a tremendous act of kindness, it's a big mitzvah. Plus it's training you to be considerate, to feel for others. Helping the elders, the zekenim, whether it's an old lady crossing the street, whether it's getting up and giving her your seat on the bus. All of these kind of things help fine-tune the Midat HaRachmanut in, in, in us. An example which needs tremendous amount of uh, development in most people is the following. You have a situation where the individual is a difficult person. He comes to you and complains, gives you a hard time, and uh, you could easily ignore him, you could easily avoid him, or you could easily yell at him, stop nagging so much, if you react, you may not be reacting in the best way. One of the ways to deal with difficult people, the rabbis tell us, Al tadunet komo. This is a very important principle to keep in mind. Whenever we are being judgmental and we're saying this good for nothing, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't go to work, he's just begging for money, he's just taking advantage of other people, it's very easy to be negative and to look down at people and, and, and not be considerate. We're talking about in situations where they're asking for it because they're being so hard. In those situations where people are asking for it because they're being so obnoxious, you can still be compassionate. Don't judge him until you're in his shoes. What does that mean? Start thinking for a moment. You know what? This man, you know, you know what kind of a home he was raised in? He was raised in a broken home. His parents got divorced, or they fought. And this is what he saw, the abuse going on in the home. Or his father was an alcoholic. Or he grew up in a place where there were no Jews. Don't judge an individual until you are in his shoes. Do you know how you would be, what you would say, how you would act, if you were to be in the exact same situation or circumstances that he was? Very important, therefore, idea. Al tadunet chaverchach tagilem komo. If you're involved with, with a situation where a person is really being a pest or a pain, think for a moment, wait a minute, maybe I should still feel for him because it's not his fault. I can't just judge him by what I see now. I have to judge him how I would be. If I were to go through the exact same things that he went, who knows how I would be, chaz shalom. This thought or these, this mamar chazal that the rabbis tell us, think about this, will help us even with difficult people. Even though we think they don't deserve our attention and an Ahmadut, but wait a minute, maybe they do deserve it. Maybe it's not completely his fault. So once I start, once I begin to think about that, I can still retain my Rahmanut even for difficult people. Another very important idea which we mentioned in the past, which is helpful in other Midot as well, is always smile. When you somebody comes to you, whether it's in the street, good morning, how are you doing? Somebody comes to your home. Some people have the tendency to be very serious. Because of their seriousness, they don't smile so often. You have to crack a joke to get them to laugh, to really laugh. Right? Otherwise, they're not, they, don't, they don't ever smile. 
it's not too good because sometimes when you don't smile to people, they think you have something against them. You don't say Shabbat Shalom to them on the street. They're saying, well, he doesn't care about me. He's not responsible. And you may have just been, were minding your own business. You were thinking about something that, you know, that just took away your attention. You didn't realize the guy was sitting or standing or walking next to you. Be sensitive. Some people are really insulted, offended if you don't say hello to them. Some people don't care. Some people do care. So it's a good habit to get used to. Simple. Rabbis tell us, be welcoming. Have a smile on your face. And this way, you know, a smile is also addictive. In other words, if you smile, he will smile. So it's, it's a good way of treating people, of uh, meeting with people, confronting people. Besever panim yafot. How does this one help with Rahmanu? Because if you're smiling to them, if you're nice to them, then you hopefully you won't have anything against them. You're just being nice. So it's easier to be considerate to someone who you are smiling to than to someone who you're not smiling to. It's going to be a little hard to smile to a homeless person, I know. Some of these homeless persons do not bring a smile to our face. You know, we sometimes feel even disgusted by what we see. But remember what I said before, you have to look at the big picture. And the bigger picture is, is it really their fault that they, the way they are? You know? When it comes to charity, and you see somebody coming to your door and asking for money, don't just give him money. Ask him how he's doing. Maybe he wants a glass of water. He's been running around the whole day. Take him into your house. If you have the time, sit down with him. So tell me a little bit about your problem. The more you hear him, the more you will identify with him, the more you will, your compassion will be aroused. If you just treat it as something automatic, okay, here's $5, here's $10, here's $18. That's very nice of you that you gave tzedakah, you fulfilled the mitzvah. But the rabbis tell us whoever gives charity and he says a kind word to the poor man, he will be blessed with more blessings than just giving the money. So you gave the money, plus you said a kind word, plus you let him in, plus you heard his story, plus you gave him a glass of water. All of this counts a lot more than just giving him the money. Plus, it fine-tunes the Midat rahmanut It allows the Rahmanut, the compassion in one, to be more developed, not, not to be degraded or diluted. And sometimes it takes effort. For some people, as I said before, it comes naturally. Yes, come in. Come on in. Would you like a meal for Shabbat? You have a place where to be. You can be here. Some people are very welcoming. That's by nature. But some people have to force themselves because it doesn't come to them. So that is what we have to learn. For those things that don't come easily to us that are important, like Rahmanut and sensitivity for everybody, we have to do things that will develop or cultivate them. At home, it is a very good idea if there's ever a natural disaster in the world that like we've been having lately, whether it's in Haiti, where hundreds of thousands of people lost their life. So what if they're a different color? So what if they're from a different religion? So what if they're a different class? They're human beings. In your home, if you share this news with your kids, just say, poor fellows, miskenim, as we say in Hebrew. Poor fellows, look how many of them lost their lives, their homes, everything. Some of them lost everything, their family members broken, injured, poor, even poorer than before. The kids at their home have to see that the parents are sensitive. Otherwise, they're not going to be sensitive. Good for them. They're nothing. They're this, they're that. They're, they're... Chaz v'shalom. Never, never, never do that. That was the mistake of Yonah. Remember the story with Yonah? He was trying to run away. Why was he running away from going to give prophecy and a message to the city of Nineveh? Because the city of Nineveh is Goyim. So what? Well, he had a different agenda. He knew that these goyim in Nineveh are going to do Teshuvah. They're going to take his word seriously when he comes threatening them. And if the non-Jews do Teshuvah, you know how this is going to look upstairs? Non-Jews are doing Teshuvah, repenting, and the Jews are not. So this was going to be an accusation against the Jews. So that's why he felt a little bit bad. And he did not like this mission of going to rebuke or threaten goyim. But what does Hashem tell him? These, I created them just like any, anybody else. Whether they're Chinese or Mongolians or Vietnamese, they're still human beings, regardless of how they look, regardless of what their name is, of, of their, of their, even of what their religion is. It makes no difference. They're human beings, number one. Shem has compassion for human beings, 
for animals, for everything that he created. This is all his creation. Hashem wants you to be like him. Hashem gave you this midah that he has. So use it. Use it for everybody alike. Don't discriminate. So at home, as a chinuch, as an, as, a, as, an, as an education for the children, show that we care and we are sensitive to everybody. Jews are leaving Egypt. Malachim want to say shira, they want to sing. Hashem said, you're going to sing now when my creations are drowning in the sea? Oh, wow, your creation? These are the Egyptians who, who killed your kids, your, the Jews. They're still my creation. The Jews, after they left, they said, Az Yashir Moshe. Once they left and once they came to safely arrived in dry land, what did they say? What did they sing? Hashem, thank you for saving us, not for drowning the Egyptians. We're not happy that they drowned, that they lost their life. We're happy that we were saved. So the right attitude is not good. The enemy is gone because the enemy is no good. Thank God that the enemy is gone so they don't pursue us anymore. So we don't, we don't, we're not happy for their demise. We're happy for our salvation. So we have to show our kids too that we care about everybody. When it comes to dealing with difficult people, just remember, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. It requires a tremendous amount of patience, which we spoke about before, right, last week. It requires other midot, like controlling your anger. When it, when we, when it comes to dealing with difficult situations, we need a lot of midot, not just compassion. Rezat Hashem will be speaking about pitachon, having faith in God, that if I'm facing face-to-face -face with a very difficult individual or a difficult situation. It was meant for me to face it. Bitachon will help me. Da'aga is another midah I think that we'll be speaking about next week, not to worry. There's a lot of good midot that if we develop them, will help us a great deal in life. Because we all, all go through difficult situations, whether it's economics, whether it's difficult people, whether it's whatever, children, hardships, neighbors, all kinds of things, health matters. So one needs to have a certain amount of, of not only bitachon in Hashem, but a certain, a certain degree of, of understanding and clarity what these things mean. That this could be a nisayon, this could be a challenge, this could be something that they, they want to see how I'm going to react. Oh, I better behave myself, I better react correctly, otherwise I'm going to, I'm going to lose it. Right? So the more a person understands what, is, what, he, what he's facing, the calmer he will be. The less worried he will be. He will react more positively and correctly. He will not make a mistake. And if he's ever in doubt, he will ask. And he will not do things without asking because he doesn't want to make a mistake. So there's a lot of good midot that can help us with difficult people in difficult situations. But just remember, when it comes to difficult, very difficult people, just think of for a moment what has transpired over them. What could have gone wrong? That he's, he's so terrible. And he's so abusive. One of the mistakes people make, and that is why they're not compassionate and, and considerate, is because they look at the differences. I'm like that, and he is like that. Oh, we don't like that. One of the ways that we can be helped is instead of looking at what is different about us, let us look at what is the same about us. Hey, wait a minute, we're both Jewish. We both want to be happy in life. We both want to have a family. And we both want to be comfortable. Look at all the things that we both want to have or, ha or you know, would like to have, right? So instead of looking at the differences, if we look at more what we both have or what we both want to have, we will be able to still be compassionate, even with those who are very different and irksome, or you know, those who are bothering us. Because we're focusing on what we have in common instead of the differences. There are those individuals, who, however, who are very, very difficult. And those are the ones who abuse us, inflict pain on us, use derogatory remarks, hurt us. Those are the most difficult of all. And how do you deal with them? Psychologists claim that... Most people, 99% of the people who misbehave in a really, really bad way with you, hurt you, insult you, uh, cause you pain, 99% of these people don't intentionally want to do that. 
<coughs> okay, listen to this very carefully. They don't intentionally want to do it. Most people in the world don't have pleasure in inflicting pain on you. It's going to give them pain. You know, it's going to give me pleasure. Most people don't want to do it. Why do they do it? Because they are in pain. They are in pain. Something bothers them and they're using this as a defense mechanism for themselves. So when people come out and lash out at you and inflict some kind of pain or say some remark, remember, they don't necessarily want to do it intentionally. Once we start thinking about it, wait a minute, why is this coming from him? Why is he behaving this way? He is in pain. That's why he's doing it. He doesn't want to do it intentionally. There's a big difference. If somebody wants to do something intentionally, then he's a rasha. Most people are not like that. Very few are. Those are the problematic people. But if this guy is not, doesn't have some, some psychological problem, then he is in pain. And what he's doing is some sort of defense mechanism. That's all it is. Then have pity on him. Misken. He doesn't know how to control himself. He needs help. That's a better way of looking at him and dealing with him than, oh, how terrible, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get back at him. I'm going to show him who's the boss. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, whatever. That's reactionary. That's not good judgment. The better judgment is this man or this woman needs help if they're behaving that way because that's not normal. They must be in a lot of pain if they're doing that. That's the correct way to look at them. There are certain people, however, who will have a difficulty cultivating empathy or compassion. And if anybody in here does not understand what empathy is, empathy means to empathize with someone, to feel for someone, to feel someone's pain. It's a little different than compassion. I lumped them all together, compassion, sensitivity, empathy, uh, mercy, because Rahmanut or Rahamim is really mercy. Uh, in Hebrew, there's another word for Rahmanut, which is a little bit different, called Hemla, Lachmol. And that is to empathize or to have pity for someone. Anybody who has an antisocial personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, will, will have a difficult time cultivating empathy for others. Anybody who is a nar who has who's a narcissist, Everybody know, you know what a narcissist is? Narcissism? Mm -hmm. It's a form of selfishness. A person sees only himself, he doesn't see anybody else. That's called narcissist or narcissism. He will also have a problem. He's, his judgment is impaired. He cannot fully empathize with others. Anybody who has an addiction to something, a real addiction, also will have problem or difficulties cultivating this empathy for others. He can't. It's just it's very, very difficult for them. So these types of people will have a problem developing Rahmanut. Otherwise, everybody can if they use the right tools and they have the will to be compassionate and sensitive. There are ways to cultivate it. There are people who feel very depressed and sad because of how people treat them. And to them, I say what another psychologist said, be very careful not to think that the world treats you like trash. Because anybody who thinks that the world is treating him like trash will never have the ability to love. If that's the way he really feels, it will be very difficult. He will be, very, he will be impaired, completely impaired of even cultivating, forget about the pity, love. Be very careful how you think about yourself. Because even though it appears that they think of you like trash, it's not so. What did we say before? They may be in pain. They may have gone through some experience, and that is why they react the way they react. Look at the big picture. It's not that they are treating you like trash, even though it appears like that sometimes. And there's a danger if you think that way. It will be hard for somebody who feels that way to develop, to even feel to have love for other people. Another idea that I think is also a little bit helpful is whenever you have a conversation with someone and it may lead to an argument, listen more than what you talk. A lot of people tend to jump in, interrupt, talk, want to voice their opinion. Let him say what he has to say and listen to everything. Because when we begin to listen more than what we talk, it helps us stay calm, plus to perhaps see the bigger picture and have more pity on him. 
if we start interrupting and saying what we have to say, we never really get a feel for where this person is coming from. What is troubling him? Listen to everything he has to say. Then you may feel sorry for him. I'd like to finish with a situation that Bezat Hashem will talk a little bit about more when we speak about being a kapdan, being strict or demanding. But I'm just going to say it right now because it's also relevant. And that is there are times that you can just as easily be strict and just as easily be compassionate. You can be either or you want. An example would be when you go to court. You go to court with someone, okay? Now, you know there's something called settlement out of court, right? You can always settle. If it's possible, you're always better off settling out of court. You're always better off making a compromise. The rabbis and the judges are also encouraged to try, before the trial begins, to push for a compromise. Because if you don't push for a compromise and you are strict with the letter of the law, with the halakha, the Shulchan Aruch says so and so, you know what you're going to accomplish? You may know who is right and who is wrong, but those two people who came will continue to be enemies. They won't like each other. One won and one, the other one lost. Always try, if possible, not to be strict. If possible, try to find a way of compromise. And this is what I found Lincoln says. Yes, Abraham Lincoln, remember him? <laughs> Interesting fellow. This is what he writes. I have always found that mercy bears richer fruit than strict justice. I have always found that mercy bears richer fruit than strict justice. You're always going to get a lot more in life if you're nice and compassionate, right? If you're merciful and, and, and sensitive, you're always going to gain a lot more this way than always being strict and, and, and insisting on your way. Another famous saying is whatever, whatever goes around comes around. Have you heard about that one? If you're going to be one way towards people, well, eventually it's going to come around. People are going to be that way towards you too. There's an interesting Yerushalmi that I just saw recently. That It says like this, if you ever seek up close a scorpion or a snake and they don't harm you, guess what? Hashem has just had compassion on you. Something was meant to happen, but because Hashem is compassionate on you, it did not let it happen. But this was a sign. This was a sign. Something worse could have happened. And look, He was compassionate over you. Be compassionate towards others as well. It could have been different. There is one individual, however, that you don't have to have compassion and pity for. And who is that? Besides the very wicked people. Rabbis tell us, Kol she'en lo de'a asur lerachem alav. Whoever does not have any intelligence, don't have any pity for him. What does that mean? On the contrary, we've been saying before, whoever is a miskin, a poor fellow doesn't know any better, be pity. The rabbis meant, and I think it's explained a little bit more, more in the Silat Yesharim, whoever does not have intelligence means that whoever who knows the right thing, but still doesn't follow through, doesn't want to help himself, he knows what the, he needs to do and still doesn't do it, just leave him alone. As the rabbis tell him, if I don't help myself, who's going to help me? I have to want myself. And if you see this guy who has been told once, twice, three times that what he's doing is wrong, that he better change, and he doesn't care, he doesn't listen, he doesn't change, don't have any pity on him. He's ruining his own life. That is the only one you don't have to have pity for because he knows better. I, I read that the Stipler, Zechet Tzadik Rafa, in speaking about this passage in Chazal, says whoever has no de'a is talking about an ungrateful person. A person who's ungrateful, you don't have to have pity on him either. He should know better than that to be grateful. But that's another interpretation. I'd like to remind every one of us that it's a, this midah, midah tarachamim, is a very important midah, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because upstairs they will judge us very, very much on how we relate to others, if we're compassionate to them or not. It's not just correct. It's not only good and nice. It's not only a commandment in the Torah to be considered. They will also judge us. This is a midah that they look after. This is a midah where they will examine us. How did we act with others when we were given a situation where we could have helped, 
we could have been compassionate, we could have been considerate, and we were not, chas v'shalom, as I said before, whatever goes on comes around. This is one midah that they're very, very strict about. This is the midah of Hashem, remember. One of the midot of Hashem. And he wants to make sure that we as Jews especially are extra sensitive. And that is why the rabbis tell us, kol ha-merachem al abriot, merachamim al Whoever will be compassionate and treat others fairly and with compassion, Bezat Hashem, he will also receive compassion from Hashem. In other words, Mishamayim, they will be compassionate over him. He has shown to be sensitive in caring for others. Whenever he needs help, they will help him out. So this is a tremendous promise that we have, that if we are sensitive and considerate of others, Mishamayim, they will remember that, and whenever we need their help, they will be there for us. Thank you. Good. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's called Mercy and Soil. Mercy and Compassion.